Hello, everyone. Welcome to the recorded webinar for Greater Good, Humanities and Academia, Application Tips and Tricks. Um, in this webinar, you will hear a lot about the background for this grant, uh, the impetus for it, what we are specifically looking for in terms of fundable projects, and we will also dive into the application tips and tricks, um, some behind the scenes uh, views of the narratives and the budget to help explain a little bit more about this funding opportunity. So the roadmap for today, I'm going to spend the first part of the webinar really diving into who we are as Florida Humanities so that if you are not familiar with us, this is your fresh start opportunity to hear about who we are, how we got started, um, and really also what the humanities are. A lot of times from our first time applicants, um, you know, depending on wherever they are, they're not familiar with uh, the definition of the humanities or public humanities programming. Um, if that is not for you, if you are already a humanities expert, a humanities faculty, please feel free to skip ahead in the presentation to the second part where we will dive into the application. Uh, however, if you are interested in learning more about the humanities, you can stay right along and follow in this presentation. So who is Florida Humanities? We are the statewide officiate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, there are two humanities um, organizations, or sorry, there are two entities in Washington, D.C., the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we are an affiliate of the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities. So every state actually have, has a humanities council and we are Florida's. And our mission, as it says here, is to preserve, promote, and share the history, literature, culture, and personal stories that offer Floridians a better understanding of themselves, their communities, and their state. So a lot of times what we get from applicants is what exactly are the humanities and how does public humanities programming differ? We can see here the disciplines in the humanities. They include history, literature, poetry, religious studies, philosophy, art history, anthropology. I won't go through them all, they're all listed here, but essentially what the humanities are is the process of pursuing an understanding of our shared human experience. And through the exploration of the humanities, we can learn how to think creatively and critically, to reason and to ask questions. Now, public humanities programming differs a little bit than just straight up projects that are rooted in the humanities. By public humanities programming, we mean programming that actively engages with the public in the humanities and fosters those constructive dialogues grounded in Florida history, heritage, and culture. So whereas some projects may be rooted in the humanities, if it does not have an active engagement and dialogue with the public, uh, that would not probably be the best fit for this programming. And by the differentiation, I'll go into that a little bit more later so you have a clear understanding of what we mean by that. So here we're gonna go over the, um, the overview of this funding opportunity, Greater Good Humanities and Academia. Overall, Florida colleges and universities humanities related departments, such as the Department of History or the Department of Political Science or Department of Anthropology, as well as humanities centers, institutes, and programs associated with Florida colleges and universities are eligible to apply for up to $5,000 in support of public humanities programming. Now, individuals already aware of Florida Humanities may um, see this as very similar to our other grant program, Community Project Grants. So I just wanted to pause and explain that Greater Good Humanities and Academia is very similar to Community Project Grants, except it's targeted specifically at supporting projects at Florida colleges and universities. So we're really encouraging our academic partners and friends to apply for this funding opportunity as not only chances of funding are higher here, um, but it's really targeted just for you. So frequently asked question, is my department and institution eligible? First, uh, we have to you know, develop some general basis understanding here. Um, so if you are a humanities related department, such as the Department of History or any of those other disciplines that we saw in the earlier slide, you would likely be eligible to apply. Um, if you are another department, um, not directly associated with the humanities, but you 
are going to do humanities related programming, we encourage you to partner with other humanities departments within your college or university to really strengthen your project. Um, also, if your department already has an open community, or sorry, open humanities centers grant or greater good humanities and academia grant, um, you are not eligible to apply. We only allow uh, one open application at a time from a singular department or institution within a college or university. So if I can clarify that even further, uh, if the Department of History at uh, University of South Florida already has a Humanities Center grant or a Greater Good Humanities and Academia grant, uh, your Department of History within USF is no longer eligible to apply. You have to close out your first grant um, before you can reapply for another grant. So you can only hold one grant at a time. However, if the Department of Religious Studies at USF wishes to apply for a grant, they are eligible because we consider uh, different departments within universities to be eligible for this opportunity. We consider them to be like different nonprofits since their budgets are oftentimes different. However, they of course share the same DUNS number. So let's go over some of the basic um, elements that are required from all of the projects that we fund. First, all projects must inspire constructive dialogue with the public. That is that public communities programming, that public engagement that we really need to see throughout the project. Next, the projects must involve humanities scholars and other subject area experts. Um, if you are the humanities scholar faculty member applying for the grant, that is wonderful. Um, and maybe also consider what other subject area experts you could include in the project personnel that would be able to strengthen your application and add additional perspectives. Third, all projects must be free and or widely available to the public. Uh, that can be in-person or virtual. Um, and so we just really wanna make sure there that there is no cost barriers that, pro that prohibit people from participating uh, and engaging with this humanities content. And fourth, all projects must make an effort, a concerted effort to attract diverse audiences um, both within and beyond the campus community. So here you wanna consider who is traditionally uh, not at the table of the conversation that you are having and how are you going to make special efforts to include them both in the development of your humanities project and in the presentation of it at the very end. So many ask, you know, what are my chances of funding if I submit an application? Like I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, presentation, because this grant is exclusively for Florida colleges and universities, your chances of funding are relatively high. This is a new funding opportunity. Um, so we see the funding chances to be a little bit a higher percentage than our other opportunities that are open to nonprofits across the state of Florida. So uh, in comparison, community project grants are much more competitive um, and this greater good has a funding percentage of about 90%. So who qualifies as a humanities scholar? We consider a humanities scholar to be an individual with a high level of experience in a humanities discipline and or is actively engaged in research or programming in that field. So you yourself may be a humanities scholar um, or if you are a grant specialist with your university watching this webinar, uh, think about the humanities scholars that are associated with your department who could be the project director or project personnel advising the project director in this effort. We also encourage the inclusion of subject area experts and community experts. Those individuals may not be considered a humanities scholar, but really contribute to the depth of the project. So here are some examples of public humanities programming. Uh, we see these come forth a lot of times through our funded work. So we like to give examples if you're just watching this webinar and hoping for a little bit of ideas to help uh, you brainstorm along your way. So the first one that we see a lot of times is lecture series and podcasts. Uh, we did fund a lot of in-person programming almost exclusively before 2020, but in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, many of our applicants are shifting to podcasts or other Zoom or virtual presentations, either one if you're bringing in a large 
a big name speaker, or maybe you want to bring in 10 different speakers and have a series of uh, lectures on a certain humanities topic. The next we see a lot is exhibits with complementary public humanities programming. If you want to bring an exhibit about a timely topic or about a historical event, we could fund a portion of that exhibit, but also that complementary programming that helps the public dive into those themes and spark that aha moment that's very characteristic of the humanities. So here, as with oral history projects, we emphasize that the funding that you request from Florida Humanities be directed, directed predominantly at that public humanities component. Uh, portions of your project can go to support uh, exhibits or the collection of oral histories. But here, what this funding is for is really how you are engaging the public in that humanities content. With oral histories, of course, we love seeing the collection of stories either from uh, the youth in our society, from certain groups that are marginalized or from elders in your communities and you wanna make sure those stories do not disappear. Uh, those are very oftentimes really very impactful public communities programming um, that we see come through our granting programs. Uh, but again, here we need to see that there is some engagement after the histories are collected, uh, how you are engaging the public in those stories and and answering that question, so what? What does this mean for our broader community? Uh, also, I will note with oral histories, we do ask that you involve a qualified oral historian um, so that we can make sure that best practices in oral histories are kept. And then fourth, we love supporting community conversations that bring in humanities advisors or scholars to present a topic and provide that context and then the community gathers in round tables and has really stirring, um, vibrant, needed conversations that bring people together, maybe from different perspectives or ideals, and it helps us see each other from a more um, empathetic lens, see our humanity a little bit more from an understanding point. Uh, that's really a great tool for the humanities in this day and age, um, where that's where a lot of current topics come into play as well. And of course, we love supporting bold new programming. Maybe your college or university is doing something different from these, um, but it's still rooted in the humanities and engages with the public. Uh, do let us know. Don't feel that you have to fit into one of these boxes. Uh, we love supporting new ideas. So what are some of the most common barriers to funding? One is uh, an art project or a performing arts project that is not specifically rooted in the humanities. While the arts, yes, comes out of the, the aspect of being human, the humanities is really that engaging with scholarship in the field, asking those questions, diving deeply into analysis and interpretation, um, answering that so what question. So that is all to say, if you had an art exhibit at your, um, your academic uh, museum, we could support bringing in humanities scholars to have a panel discussion and conversation with the artists about what the, the themes are, maybe the humanities themes that arise from their work. So we would not be able to support the creation of the mural or the actual funding of the art exhibit, but we would be able to fund that conversation and dialogue ground in the humanities that speak to that. Second, um, there is sometimes a confusion between social service projects and humanities projects. It's that humanitarian aspect um, which is very similar to the word humanities. Um, so just note that like art and performing art projects that I just mentioned, um, that there is a solid grounding in analysis and interpretation and the involvement of a humanities scholar. And then of course, projects without all the details. Maybe your project is rooted in the humanities, it is public humanities programming, but you don't quite have um, the complete full project together yet. And by that, I mean, if you wanted to do a speaker series, um, you're not quite sure who the speakers are, what they're going to talk about, um, or the timeline of it. So we would not be able to support a project that doesn't have those details. We would need to know who the scholars are that you want to bring in and what they would talk about and a rough idea, such as the month of February of when they are going to present on their topic. Another frequently asked question is what are some examples of successfully funded projects? And here we are going to pull out two that were funded through the first iteration of this grant that was called Humanity Center's Grant. If you've uh, heard me talking about that or seen that on our website, 
Um, so through that pilot grant, we funded 10 organizations. One of them was the University of North Florida. We funded their project, the Justice Session through the Digital Humanities Institute. And with a $3,000 grant from Florida Humanities, they featured community speakers on topics related to local African-American history, as well as the history and future of civil rights in Jacksonville. And their program really engaged on many community scholars from UNF and the Jacksonville community and hosted those lectures via Zoom. Um, and through those programs, they're really able to engage a wide audience, both within and beyond the campus community. Um, and the funds were directly used to support the honorarium of the speakers, uh, as well as some part of the Zoom license and transcription services, as well as marketing and outreach uh, to really include diverse audiences. So here is just a few snippets from their program. You can see their website, uh, which is very well done, and a uh, few of the programs that they have listed out there. The second project I wanted to bring out uh, as an example of a successfully funded Greater Good grant is from the University of South Florida, the Contemporary Museum of Art. Uh, their project, which you can see there, uh, we funded at $3,000 again, um, and it really supported the virtual symposium, um, which provided a broader understanding of what it means to deal with the constant storm experienced by Puerto Ricans, um, and the Florida diaspora. And the project that we funded um, was a panel discussion um, that looked at urgent challenges and possible solutions facing the Puerto Rican community after the disaster of Hurricane Maria. So their program was bilingual. So the funds from this $3,000 grant were used to support the honoraria for the humanities panelists, as well as the subject area experts and community experts as well as an English to Spanish translation interpretation fee. Uh, and again, some subscription costs from their virtual um, platform and marketing and promotion. So many ask, when must they apply? Um, this very important date is September the 29th, 2021 at 12 p.m. All of our deadlines are at noon, 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Um, so make sure you make a note of that on your calendar. Uh, and if you apply by September 29th, you will find out on October 15th if your grant is approved or denied. If it is approved, the grant period, otherwise known as the contract period for which you, can, you have to complete your project, goes from October 15th, 2021 until May 15th, 2022. So with that grant, if you are funded, we do have a six week buffer period between the contract date and when the first public program can start. And that six week buffer, um, which you know, ends on November 29th, 2021, is so that there is time for you as an awarded awardee to sign your uh, contract agreement, to request 90% of your award upfront, which we will go into, and to submit what's called an event listing form so that the grant funded event can appear on our calendar. We can invite our uh, board of directors as well as uh, staff can hopefully attend as well. So let's look at the grant life cycle for the Greater Good Humanities and Academia grant. Like we just talked about, the application deadline is September 29th. Um, and between September 30th and October 14th is the review of this grant. And all grants that are submitted are put forth before an evaluation panel that is made up of a diverse group of external humanities scholars um, that range in different backgrounds and disciplines, as well as select uh, board of directors from Florida Humanities and Florida Humanities staff. Um, so all who apply are notified on October 15th if they are approved or denied. The application is online, which we will also get into in the application tips and tricks. So similarly, um, you will look, go back into the online portal to find your funding status. And um, Florida Humanities will also be sending out direct emails to all on that notification date to let you personally know about your award. So say you are approved, you received a grant, congratulations. Um, what is the next step? So you of course have to sign the contract agreement um, make sure you coordinate, please, with your um, Office of Sponsored Research or your other appropriate fiscal officers within your college or university, um, not only throughout the application of your grant, but throughout its award as well. 
um, they are oftentimes uh, needing to be kept in the loop. So just a note on that. Um, but you can work with your appropriate fiscal party to then request 90% of your awarded funding up front. So if you're awarded $5,000, you can request $4,500 up front to work on your project. And then, of course, you are going to submit event listing forms um, as soon as you can. And we ask that you get those in uh, well before the event date so we have time to load them up on our website. And then you're going to complete your project and keep us up to date on anything. If you have changes throughout your project, if speakers have dropped or um, new restrictions are put in place and things that you wanted to have in person have to move to virtual, we are happy to be flexible. We just ask that you keep us in the loop, um, email us and submit what's called a contract change request form for us to review at least two weeks before those changes take effect um, so that we can make sure they comply with the grant as well as the federal funds which this grant originates from. And then finally, um, either 60 days after your final funded event or 60 days after closing, you're going to submit the final report. And to do that, you're going to go back into the online portal, uh, look to the follow-up form, fill that out, which looks very similar to the application, and there you are going to request a final 10% of your award. And then your department can apply for a new grant at the new deadline. So if you are denied, um, that's the other, other segue here, um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna reach out to us, reach out to Florida Humanities to seek those evaluation comments. Um, don't be discouraged. There is you know, some competitiveness with these grants and as this grant um, it gets more long-term and more available and more known, it is going to become more competitive. So that's why we really encourage all applicants to reach out to Florida Humanities and work with us throughout the development of your application. Um, but if you are denied, don't be discouraged, don't give up. Um, seek those evaluation comments and then look to reapply in a future cycle. So what are the steps to apply? First, you are going to brainstorm your project, of course. You're gonna, um, you're watching this webinar, which is a really great start. Um, do read the guidelines as well, since um, as you probably have guessed, we are not reading the guidelines here verbatim. Um, so this webinar is really a supplement to that. So go ahead and read the guidelines, make sure you understand um, you know, all that, uh, that we require for this funding opportunity and have all your um, I's dotted and T's crossed with your project. Then you're gonna contact Florida Humanities and um, request to have a, uh, you could have of course an email conversation or we'll schedule a Zoom call to talk with you personally about your project uh, to hear what you're going to do. And then there of course we can offer recommendations for increasing its competitiveness within this funding cycle. And if it is eligible, we will send you an access code because you need an access code to apply for this grant. And once you've received that access code, you're working with us throughout the application, of course, you're going to apply for funding by that new deadline on September 29th. And if you are denied, like we just talked about, seek those comments. Um, we're happy to provide comments throughout the grant. So now we're going to dive into the keys of successful applications. So if you have fast forwarded through that section since you're already a humanities expert and you've landed here, um, we're happy to have you here where if you've been watching all along. So here in this section, now that we've gone over what this grant uh, funding opportunity is for, what the humanities are and the types of public humanities programming, we're gonna actually look at some narratives and budgets. You can get a clear picture of what we're looking for here. So like with any grant application, there are a series of narratives that we ask you to write out um, to describe narratively what your project is about. Um, for example, here are the different narratives we're looking for. One is organizational mission. This is where you will describe uh, your department at your college or university. Um, this is a very typical narrative that we ask across all of our funding opportunities. Who, are, who is your organization? What kind of projects do you all typically do? What is your mission? Next, uh, humanities content and program format. This is a very important narrative. This is really what our evaluation panel looks to a lot of times first when we're looking at application because this narrative gets at what you are going to do. So in the humanities content, you're going to describe what disciplines are being brought forth through this project, how is it rooted in public humanities programming, how it engages with the public, and what is the program format? 
Is it virtual? Is it in person? Um, and then dive into the details of that. And the next is project director and project personnel. Who is the project director and how are they qualified to lead this endeavor? And then who are the additional project personnel? Maybe they are speakers that are speaking on a panel. Uh, perhaps it's that oral historian that is collecting the oral histories or other community or subject experts. And then target audience and underserved communities. Uh, who is your intended audience? And yes, it should definitely be both within and beyond the campus community. Um, maybe it's your larger region, maybe it's the entire state of Florida or the nation. Uh, we wanna see that there, what is your intended reach? And then who are underserved communities that you are making special effort to reach out to? Um, we very much consider and weigh this response and um, the, the explanations that are presented within the application. So um, it's, I would encourage all applicants to go beyond you are reaching this community. What evaluators want to know is, okay, that's great, but how are you going to reach that community? What additional community organizations are you partnering with, maybe in the promotion or the creation of this project that really showcases that connection? And then marketing, promotion, and community partners. Again, um, who are your partners that you're going to be working with in the promotion of it? Uh, where are you going to market this project? Um, here we like to see both qualitative and quantitative data. Not only what social media or news outlets, but what is their reach? What is the reach of your newsletter of your own or your partner's social media platforms? Because here evaluators want to know essentially how big of um, an impact is this project going to make? And then finally, fees. Uh, is there any cost associated with this grant project? I will note that um, we do prefer projects that have a very low fee or are, have no fee that is free to participate from the, uh, the public. If there's a fee of you know, 20 to $25 or even $15, that may be an issue because we really like to see projects come forth that are just meant to engage the public and humanities and do not provide a cost barrier to people who do not have the means to, to engage in this. So let's dive into some successful narratives now that I've gone over them. Um, here are just a few snippets of what a successful narrative looks like. Um, you know, if you're a grant writer, professional grant writer, you very much know that um, these narratives tend to be successful if they are well organized, clear and concise, um, provides great detail about the project purpose and how it is rooted in the humanities and focuses on what you are asking funding for. Um, I would also encourage all applicants to um, present their narratives at a basic understanding level. Think of it like an elevator pitch. If you're walking in an elevator and talking about your project to someone who is not familiar with your discipline or does not have a background, um, your educational background, how would you walk them through why this project is important and why it is needed uh, for everybody? So here is an example of a project director and project personnel successful narrative. Um, here they, they expertly describe who their project director is and how they are well qualified. And they also listed out their speakers for each of their sessions that they're going to do. Here we're of course, again, looking at the justice sessions um, from uh, UNF. And uh, they're also not only mentioning the person's name, but what they're going to be talking about. Um, so both those components are very important. Here is an example of successful target audience and reaching underserved communities. Uh, here, this applicant brought forth some quantitative data to back up you know, what are some of the quality data in terms of their target audience and the makeup of their community and how they're going to be specifically reaching out to those audiences. Next, we can see some example, successful examples of marketing and promotion and community partners. Um, you know, here they're clearly mentioning all the partners that they are working with um, that are involved in not only the creation of their project, but in the marketing and promotion of it. Uh, both those components are important. And some, of course, unsuccessful narratives. Um, that's not to say that this applicant was not successful in funding. Um, but that this narrative is something that uh, applicants will want to be aware of. Um, so typically unsuccessful narratives don't provide a great amount of detail about what they're going to do. Um, you know, maybe you don't use the entire word count, which is highly encouraged, um, or you don't focus specifically on what you are asking funding for. 
one trap that applicants fall into is speaking about their past successes for you know maybe 80 to 90 percent of their community's content but they're not actually mentioning what they're going to be doing that they're requesting funding for so um, that's a note for people who may be new to the grant writing experience uh, to really just be forward thinking and, and really explain to the evaluators what you're going to do with the funding if received and then also another pitfall um, with unsuccessful narratives is maybe spending about 70 to 90 percent of the narrative focusing on the history of a topic. Um, you know, this goes back to the elevator speech. You know, if you only have a minute to talk, you don't want to, you know, talk, you know, for 50 seconds about the history of something, but not that crucial. What, okay, so what are you going to do throughout the life cycle of this grant? Um, there is a word count, so unfortunately, um, think about the structure of your paragraphs. Now we're going to dive into the budget. So like with any grant, uh, we have budget built into the online application. Um, and we have listed out a few line items that you can request funding for. Uh, these line items are honoraria, travel per diem and lodging, marketing and outreach, and other. Um, if the bulk of your requested funds fall into other, um, don't you know, that does not necessarily mean that your project is not fundable or it's not going to be as competitive. That may be because it is a, maybe a bold, innovative project that just doesn't look like a project that has honoraria. Um, but do reach out to us and have that conversation and just say, hey, we're thinking about requesting funding for this, for our project. Is this eligible? And we'd be happy to answer that question. So for honoraria, uh, you are encouraged to request funding to support the humanities scholars involved in your project and the um, additional community experts, subject area experts that are in conversation with the humanities scholar. You will notice in the budget, we do ask that you um, not request funding for uh, scholars whose duties that they are performing are normally part of their salaried duties. We would consider that as overhead and, and already part of what they are paid for that's associated with their university. Um, however, if what they are doing associated with your project is outside of their normal duties associated with being a professor or faculty member, you can make that case within the application. But please um, just do list that out so that that is clear for the evaluators. Travel per diem and lodging. Um, if your scholars or subject area experts are having to travel, um, from out of state or from another region of Florida, you can request funding for their hotel rooms um, or their mileage or their airfare. Um, marketing and outreach, you know, maybe you want to request funding for Facebook ads or um, newsprint ads or the creation of graphics, um, or perhaps it's audiovisual needs. Um, you know, you can ask it there. And then other, perhaps there is um, exhibit costs or you know, other fees that are just that don't fit into those above, above three buckets. Um, you can put that in other. So within the budget in the online application, there are two fields associated with each line item. And here we've pulled out honoraria so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, honoraria request is where you will put the funds that you were requesting from Florida Communities for that specific line item. So if you have a budget of $4,000, um, $2,000, you're requesting an honoraria, and then $1,000 in travel and lodging and $1,000 in marketing and promotion, here you can see the applicant is requesting funding uh, $2,000 in honoraria. And then very important, below that is a, um, is a field, a paragraph field, where you will describe the makeout of that $2,000. Well, we need to see, evaluators really need to see where those funds are going to be spent. Um, unfortunately, we cannot award funds for unknown costs, for blanket costs, um, just, you know, at faith. Um, as a funder, you know, as a responsible funder, we just need to see where those uh, federal funds are going. So here the applicant requested $2,000. Um, they narratively described what, where those funds are going, um, that they are outside perhaps of their um, duties as, as their faculty, as their professorship. And then they list the four professors they're requesting funding for and the cost associated with each of them. And then some unsuccessful budgets. Um, perhaps the budget detail is, is incomplete. Uh, they do not describe the line items. Um, perhaps the budget asks for unallowable costs. Um, unallowable costs, I will not dive into fully here, 
those are found in the guidelines. We've listed out a bunch of things that are not fundable. Uh, and that is, you know, items that are not fundable because these funds originate from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the NEH. Um, and because these are federal funds, we cannot support costs that associate with advocacy, um, that are food or beverages, and uh, a few other items that are listed on there. So do take a look at the guidelines when you're crafting your budget. And cost share, the very important item. So this grant, like our other grants at Florida Communities, do require a one-to-one -one match or cost share. Um, if you are unfamiliar with cost share, cost share are all those costs associated with a project that are not paid directly by the granting organization, in this case, Florida Humanities, but are paid instead using resources either within the organization, or your organization I'm referring to, or from outside your entity or organization through other grants or sponsorships. Uh, this is called cash, cash cost share or in-kind cost share. So the cost share or match um, associated with greater good humanities and academia can come from either in-kind or cash, um, a combination of them or one or the other. Um, it can be solely cash, it can be solely in-kind. That is up to you. What we just need to see is there is at least a one-to-one -one match. And by that, I mean, if you are requesting $5,000, you have to show 5,000 in cost share. Now, what about indirect costs? So according to the National Endowment for the Humanities, if you have a federally negotiated indirect cost rate, what's called a NICRA rate, uh, we can accept that with Florida Humanities funds. That is, you can request um, that federally negotiated indirect cost rate from the funds you're requesting from Florida Humanities. So um, and while that is the case and we can accept that, we do encourage all of the costs that you request from us to go directly towards the public humanities programming and that those indirect costs be recorded in cost share. And that is because this grant is you know, only $5,000 um, and we do like to see that all of our funds go directly towards making a very successful project. So are you ready to apply for funding? What you're going to do is you are going to go to our online application portal, um, which can be found on our website. Just go to the webpage for Greater Good and you can see the link to apply. So that'll bring you here. Um, and what you're going to do is uh, if you already have an account, if your department already has an account, you are going to log in. If you are not sure, um, reach out to me. I'm happy to let you know. I can do a quick search and let you know if your department already has an account with us. Uh, like we went through in eligible applications, each department within one university or college is eligible to apply. So we encourage you to apply through your department. Of course, the sponsoring organization, the contract will be made uh, to, you know, your department, your uh, college overall, or perhaps the foundation associated with your college, but the applicant organization will be the department. And that is so we can differentiate okay, there are, you know, three different departments within University of Central Florida that are applying for the grant, and we need to see the distinction between those, so evaluators are clear which department is applying for which project. Now, once you've had a conversation with Florida community staff and uh, your project has been determined to be eligible, you are going to enter the access code um, that you are being given via email at that very top where it says enter access code. So once you've applied, you've created an account or you're either logged into your organization or your department's account, that's where you're going to enter your access code. And also make sure you are in this apply tab up here. If you are in the home tab, you will see something different. It's going to show your historic requests, maybe your active requests. Um, so make sure you click apply and then you will see this section pop up where you're going to enter the access code. So the contact for this grant is um, going to be Stephanie Chill to reach out to discuss your project. Um, Stephanie's email is schill at flahum.org, flahum.org. Stephanie is the grants coordinator, um, so she'd be happy to have that initial conversation with you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, we're here, we're happy to help, we're happy to assist. These are federal funds, so we feel like it's our, um, it's really, our job and we love doing it to help you understand what these guidelines are, how you can make these, um, this project more accessible to a broader audience, um, and to really dive into explaining anything within the online application, within the guidelines, 
we are here to help. So again, here is our contact information. Um, you know, my name is Lindsay Morrison. This presentation is from me um, as the grants director. And I'm very fortunate to work with our grants coordinator, Stephanie Chill, um, who would be happy to discuss this opportunity with you. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you very much for watching.